by the Georgetown Cultural Citizens Memorial Association and the Southeast Georgetown Community Council, lovingly known as GCCMA and SEGCC respectively. My name is Regina Durden and I will be your moderator for this session. Mr. Chuck Collins with SEGCC will be assisting by monitoring and being our engineer for the session. You're doing a great job, Chuck. This morning, we're taking time out to get to know our candidates running for the city of Georgetown mayor. We thank you so much for joining us and I'd like to introduce our candidates to you right now. First, we have Mr. Larry Brundage. Good morning, Mr. Brundage, how are you? Very well, thank you. Good, thank you. And then we have Mr. Josh Schroeder. Good morning, Mr. Schroeder, how are you? Good morning, how are y'all doing? Yeah, we, we also had uh, Mr. Jonathan Dave. He's not with us today, but we're going to speak to who we have in the sessions right now. Okay, so we'll let us get started. We're going to ask our candidates questions that impact our community as we make our decision for this 2020 election. But before we begin, I do have a few announcements. Everyone is on mute right now uh, to preserve the quality of, of the uh, filming that we're having. Um, okay, Mr. Dade is joining us. Looks like, good. I'm here, he's saying I'm here, I'm here. So that's good. Chuck, you getting ready to switch him over? Okay, as, as uh, Chuck is switching Mr. Dade over, I'll go ahead and finish with my announcements for you. Be just one second. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and just give these little uh, notes. Um, so if you have questions uh, for the candidates, we will be collecting the questions on slido.com. So that's www.slido.com. And it's, uh, you'd enter in, I'm sorry, you'd enter in A415. Questions? will be asked based on popularity of the questions posted, but we did send questions to the candidates. And so um, if we see that there's some questions that are popular, we may pop in those questions from Slido. And if we have time at the end, we will ask those questions as well. Don't ask your questions in the Q&A or chat box, but instead go over to Slido and enter your questions there. Before we begin, I want to say hello to Mr. Jonathan Dade. How are you? I'm doing good. Sorry about some of the uh, technical difficulties, but I am here. Great. I'm so glad you're here. So what we want to do, I want to kind of let everyone know what our format is and get started. Since there's three of you, we want to make sure that we have adequate time to hear all that you have to say. The forum will begin uh, having our candidates do an introduction. You'll have three minutes to offer opening statements. After the opening statements, we'll have a series of questions where you'll be giving three, you'll be given three, at, at the most, three minutes to respond. Uh, and we'll continue the questions uh, throughout the, the, the hour. And then, um, then at the end, we'll give you time to uh, give closing remarks. If we find that there are more questions on Slido that are becoming popular, we may pop some of those questions in as well. So be ready to answer those unexpected questions, okay? So what we'll do now is begin with introductions. Uh, each candidate will begin with a three minute introduction. The in introductions will include your background, why you're seeking this position of mayor, and what do you see the duties of mayor to be? So we'll start with Mr. Brundage. Your three minutes begins now. Thank you. My name is Larry Brundage. Uh, I want to be your mayor. I'm uh, 75 years of age and I have a lot to say, so I'm just gonna jump right in. The last 27 months to, uh, have been a journey for me. The purpose was to determine why uh, apparently routinely and indiscriminately the city council uh, approved projects 
throughout the city without any regard to their impact on our infrastructure, uh, our society, and our city. The, uh, the journey has become a crucible. I have uh, taken facts from a number of sources, uh, from Clark Thurman of the uh, Sun, from water seminars. Uh, I've attended virtually every city council meeting for the last uh, two and a half years, every uh, uh, workshop, uh, gleaned every uh, conversation that has been conducted and gathered information. And uh, I have come to a conclusion. Uh, we are in trouble. This year's charge on our fiscal budget for our electrical debacle is $105 million. Uh, that will be paid virtually by uh, revenue bonds that will uh, be paid by rates that you and I will uh, uh, incur. This is unsustainable. Uh, the news is that it's coming to an end. Uh, I, I hope it's a good end, but uh, uh, we will be talking about the end and what my plan is for the end. Uh, I decided in November of last year that uh, I couldn't accomplish what I needed to accomplish uh, by being on the outside, I decided to run for mayor and hence my campaign. I have stressed honesty, intelligence, and transparency. I will deliver those. As mayor, I will be proactive. I will do more than uh, kiss babies and shake pom poms. I will be uh, uh, thoroughly versed in all the issues that face the city. So the next time that some wise guy comes along and thinks he can revolutionize our city, I will have uh, the questions to ask uh, in due diligence to make sure we don't screw up again. I'm looking forward to the questions. I thank you for your time. The price of freedom is its responsible exercise and I appreciate each and every one of you being here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brundage. Mr. Dade, your three minutes begin now. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right, you can tell I'm on the beach here in Hawaii right now. I'm kidding. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I actually do agree with uh, Mr. Brundage. We are in trouble uh, as the city of Georgetown. Um, there are some things we need to do. There really are. Um, there's some things we need to fix. And that's one of the reasons why I'm running here for Georgetown uh, to be the, the mayor. And uh, I also agree with Mr. Brundage um, we need to do more than just shake hands and kiss. I think the, the phrase is kiss babies, not bonbons, but uh, we do need to do more than just uh, shake hands and kiss babies. We actually need to improve our city. Um, as far as my professional background, um, I'm an MBA, a master's in business administration. I also have my master's in theological studies. I served six years in the United States Navy, a conflict wounded veteran. Um, after that, I was in corporate America for a couple of years. I worked for PepsiCo Frito-Lay and then for Michelin. And that's actually what brought me back to Texas. My dad was military as well. Uh, so we actually lived in Texas uh, when I was in high school. My dad, uh, we moved a lot uh, growing up. So when people ask me, where are you from? It's kind of the everywhere <laughs> answer. Uh, I, just, I just lived a lot of places growing up uh, to include my military stint. Uh, what I wanna do, uh, for Georgetown uh, specifically, uh, aside from providing a place for my family to live, um, I've got my wife and my children. Um, they go to Grace Academy, uh, nine and seven years old uh, here in Georgetown. Uh, aside, in, aside from giving them a place to live, um, I wanna manage the growth. I think we are growing too fast and in a way that is gentrifying and it's also pricing out the working class American from Georgetown, so I want to I want to do a little bit more to solve that problem. I want to manage the growth. I also want to improve public safety. I am a police chaplain, and I also chaplain for a lot of organizations. Um, I think that our police department is amazing. I mean, Chief Nero does an amazing job, but as any department or organization, we can do better. Um, so there's things I think we can improve um, with our public safety, and I also want to increase the transparency. So that's why I'm running for mayor here in Georgetown, and I'm excited to be on this forum today, and uh, we will see how well I do. Thank you very much uh, for this time today.
Thank you, Mr. Dade and Mr. Schroeder. Your three minutes begins now. Thank you. A uh, little bit of background on me. I grew up in uh, Taylor, Texas, just 19 miles to the east, so I haven't made it that far in life. But uh, I went to uh, the University of Texas uh, for undergrad and law school and, and met my wife there. Uh, and then we moved around a, a, a lot right after we got married. Uh, but when it was time to have kids, we wanted to find a place uh, that was like the small towns that we grew up in. She grew up in a small town uh, north of Fort Worth. And we wanted to be able to live in a place where you could live, work, send your kids to school and go to church all in the same community. And, and we found that was pretty difficult in other places, especially up in Dallas. Everybody's driving around to 15 different places for all those things. And when uh, we decided to make Georgetown, Texas, our home, you know, what we knew is that that Georgetown was growing and that the difficult task that we had in front of us was how do we maintain that small town charm that made this call uh, Georgetown our home. And, and so that's why I'm running. I, I believe in Georgetown, Texas. I believe that we have great community, one of the most wonderful communities in the United States. Uh, but we got a lot of work to keep it this way. Uh, and so my professional career, I'm an attorney, um, office right on the square here in Georgetown. A law firm's been here over 30 years. And one of the first things that those guys told me when I got to town was, hey, we don't just take from this community, we serve. Uh, and so they uh, encouraged me to get involved in, in the civic uh, side of the community and the nonprofit side of the community. Uh, nonprofits are, are where my heart is. Uh, I've served on, on almost every nonprofit board in this community, and, and I love that work. And I think we have one of the most generous, innovative communities in the world here in Georgetown, Texas, with things like Lone Star Circle of Care and the Caring Place uh, and uh, Brookwood and Georgetown. And we have an amazing community. Uh, I then decided to get involved on the city side uh, and have volunteered for, for lots of boards and commissions on the city side and kind of seen how the sausage gets made. And, and there's no question that sometimes it's not a pretty sight. Uh, but what I can tell you is that we have lots of wonderful folks uh, that are committed to this community. And I think that if we can all join arms together, we can keep Georgetown that same wonderful place that we chose to make our home. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for those great introductions. So now we're gonna get into the questions. Our first question is gonna deal with Georgetown housing. The 2030 comprehensive plan adopted by the city council on March 10th, 2020 includes housing elements uh, with three themes, affordability, neighborhood preservation and diversity. It appears though, to be difficult to initiate conversation with city leaders about affordable housing. And this is uh, subject to con constantly being placed on the back burner while there's a definite need over the last two years for affordable housing. What are your criteria for determining the need for constructing new affordable housing for you know, the everyday worker, for service workers, retail employee workers, the health attendees, professional uh, teachers, senior citizens, et cetera. Um, we'll start with you, Mr. Day. Three minutes begins now. Uh, thank you very much for this question. I'm actually very passionate uh, about this topic. Um, Georgetown clearly has an opportunity to do more when it comes to diversity and affordable housing. Unfortunately, our answer previously has been we want to have quality development and we want to basically cater uh, to the needs of developers who uh, help us build 300, 400, 500, 600, and even more thousand dollar homes. And that obviously does not connect with the workers, the middle class here in Georgetown. I actually met with a group of developers who wants to come to Georgetown and wants to help develop some homes that are actually attainable for individuals who make less than 500, 400 and $300,000 uh, per year. And I think it's very, very, very important for us to be able to allow and to enable and to encourage uh, such type of workers to live here. And the reason why is because every restaurant we go to, I mean, literally every restaurant you go to, they have a help wanted sign. And the reason why they have a help wanted sign is because the workers cannot afford to live here in Georgetown. So they live in other locations. 
And as soon as affordable housing comes to the other places they're living, or as soon as they find a job wherever else they're living, they're going to start working there. And then we have to raise the price of everything in order to be able to pay them more to live here in Georgetown. So um, I, I really appreciate what um, my opponent, Josh Rader, said about everyone being able to live, work, go to school, and go to church in Georgetown. I actually think that needs to be everyone everyone, whether or not you are middle class, upper class, or lower class, uh, you deserve the opportunity to live, work, go to school, and go to work in Georgetown. Uh, so I've been meeting with some of those developers that develop um, different housing uh, units that would be able to be uh, applied to individuals who make a little bit less amount of money. And I want to do everything we can to make sure we do that. And then the last thing I'll touch on, I, I know I mentioned on affordability, but diversity, um, I think it is long since due, especially in today's uh, current climate, uh, that diversity is very important. I've been interacting with some constituents. Um, they're not going to vote for me, and that's okay. Um, but there's been some constituents that says there's no racism in Georgetown. There's absolutely no racial issues in Georgetown. And I think that, that needs to be addressed. I do believe uh, that there are racial issues and we need to work on diversity. And I look forward to doing that. And uh, I see my little red flag, so I will wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much. But um, yes, we do need to work on diversity and also affordability here in Georgetown. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Day. Mr. Schroeder, your time begins now. Thank you. Uh, so I worked on the 2030 comprehensive plan uh, for almost two years of my life. Uh, we spent a lot of time on that, and, and you're correct that the comprehensive plan calls for uh, diversity, affordability, and preservation. Uh, that, that plan also calls on city council to balance financial stability of the city, uh, and that's one thing that I think we have to look at as a city, is that every project needs to be a balance between competing interests quality and affordability, financial stability and diversity, all of those things have to be balanced. There has been one tax credit affordable housing project that was denied in Georgetown, Texas in the last five years. Uh, that project also did not want to pay any property taxes in addition to receiving the federal tax credit. Uh, and I will tell you, I am not in favor of apartment complexes that are subsidized by the federal government and us saying that's our affordable housing answer. Because let me tell you who gets rich on those projects, the developers. And you know, I know people wanna talk about me being the developer candidate and yada, yada. The people who get rich on a tax credit multifamily product are the developers. The folks living in those uh, units don't have any home ownership. They're not accruing any equity. Uh, and so we're making one group of people rich when we say we're putting all of our eggs in that basket. Now, I think that that is a component of affordable housing in every community, and that's great. We need that. What I want to see is us get, get innovative. I want to see us allow for duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes throughout the community without any additional zoning regulations. I want to see us be able to create accessory dwelling units, um, mother-in-law suites, let's call them, that, that can be created on a legal lot so that folks can buy that mother-in-law suite and, and have it a smaller home uh, that they can afford. Those are the types of things we need to do as a community uh, to create affordability. And one thing that I will tell you too is, I, I, and I somewhat disagree with my opponents on this, I want wages to go up in this community. I want restaurants to have to pay more to workers because I want those workers to be able to go and afford to, to buy a home, create home ownership, create equity in that home. And if we create a, a, a bunch of false uh, affordable housing, that depresses wages in the community because restaurants aren't required to pay more because there's, there's a workforce that their housing is being subsidized. You keep people in the renter's trap and in the hourly wage trap. And, and I want people to succeed and I want them to grow wealth and I want them to be a part of this community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Schroeder. Mr. Brundage, your three minutes begins now. Thank you. The, uh... The question says it appears to be difficult to initiate a conversation with the city leaders about affordable housing. Well, that's certainly an understatement. It's impossible to start a conversation with the city leaders. The last workshop I was at where affordable housing was discussed, uh, the city council was so fractured and so competitive and so uh, 
uh, unable to cooperate with one another, that it ended in an in abject failure and was uh, the can was kicked down the road again to be handled by the next city council. Uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, this is standard uh, par for the course uh, uh, action by this uh, city council. Uh, I uh, believe that when we have my uh, planning session to start June 1st of 2021, that uh, we'll cover a number of issues uh, in a collaborative way with participants from the uh, community that we can identify criteria to be satisfied to have affordable housing. Uh, when that is done, we'll have a community uh, consensus and we'll proceed to do the job that we need to do to make sure everyone has good housing in this city. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, gentlemen, for your responses. Now we're going to move on to neighborhood preservation. There's been a lot of discussion uh, and concerns regarding neighborhood preservation for at least the past two decades. The residents of the Track Ridge Grasshopper TRG neighborhoods have fought to preserve the history and culture of their area for, from encroachment, increased traffic, building of oversized housing and other hazardous conditions. The results of recent surveys indicate that residents want to allow homeowners to remain in their homes without being subject to commercial development and the increase of property. Now we know that Georgetown is one of the fastest growing, one of the, the hottest place to live of all times. And we know that, that as, as things increase, you know, what is that doing to our communities? So how will you assist the TRG residents to achieve their goals? What new and different ideas or approaches do you have to resolving these community issues involving the community residents in developing the neighborhood plans and ensuring that they have a voting role and a voice in the process? We'll start with uh, Mr. Schroeder. Your three minutes begins now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, First and foremost, I believe that the, the residents of those areas should be able to control their own destinies. Uh, uh, they were lied to uh, many years ago, the residents of TRG, uh, about a kind of false deal uh, that I think they felt was, was put in place formally and it was not put in place. Uh, it was more just kind of an informal promise. And so if the folks in that community would uh, like to preserve their neighborhoods, prevent commercial encroachment into that neighborhood, I'm all for that. Now, I do want to make sure that the folks in that community, you know, fully understand or and are in agreement with what is going to be done to them if a small area plan is created. Uh, I spoke to a woman who uh, lived in TRG for, for decades uh, and was uh, about to sell her home and have to move into assisted living. And uh, the value that was being offered to her uh, from a commercial developer was about four times the value that she was being offered for her home uh, and then there was a builder that wanted to offer about two times uh, the value of her home, and he was going to tear it down and, and create a new, you know, build a new house on it. And I get how obtrusive and, and how unwelcome that is to a community to have that happen. Uh, but I also feel for that, for that lady who needed that money to be able to move into an assisted living home. And, and so, you know, I think we have to be very, very careful for most of us, uh, probably everyone on this, on this uh, meeting, our home is, is our largest asset. Uh, and, and if we do something intentionally to decrease or lock the value of a home for an entire area, we at least need to make sure that all the residents of that area are fully aware of that. But if that is what those folks want, I'm absolutely in favor of that. But here, I'll give you my, my innovative idea. Uh, I'm an attorney. I'm a real estate attorney. Uh, and what I want to offer to, to you and the folks in those areas right now on this forum is that whether I win or lose this race, I'd be happy to sit down with them and talk about how we can create a deed restricted area. Uh, government's not always the answer. Uh, and, and we can create these small area plans uh, by uh, voluntary agreement of the residents and create deed restrictions that will last forever. 
Uh, most, most neighborhoods that get created nowadays uh, have deed restrictions on them. And these older neighborhoods like Old Town and TRG and San Jose, just because they're older neighborhoods, don't have those restrictions. Uh, but we could absolutely go in and create those. And if enough of the residents agreed to do that, we could preserve those neighborhoods. And I'm telling you, I'm happy to do that on a pro bono basis uh, as a you know, service to those communities. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mr. Brundage, your three minutes begins now. Thank you. We all know about the electrical debacle and this city council has stolen the uh, authority from the citizens to decide what their community has become. I am going to return that authority to the citizens. The question of the next two years is what's Georgetown to become and who decides? The citizens will decide. The day I'm elected, either by referendum or petition, we will have a, an election on May the 1st, 2021, to decide whether we have a one-year moratorium to answer the issues that face our community. Before that uh, vote, three reports will be produced. The amount of water, and if we have uh, an excess or deficit, the number of highways we will need to face the 90,000 people that will be here by the end of the decade, and the secrets behind the electrical debacle. That data will be available, will be studied, we'll have the election. I think the people will overwhelmingly say, we want to decide our fate. We're going to hit the pause button and we're going to discuss the TRG. We're going to discuss the rest of our community that is suffering from the same symptoms that they are. We've been subjected to unfair, treatment, we've been overtaxed, we've been overcharged, and we've been lied to, and we're going to fix it. So when we come out of that one year period, we'll have a plan for our community. And believe me, on the first day of that, of, of that moratorium, the sky will not fall, the sun will rise, and we'll have a chance to collectively to determine our future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brondage. Mr. Dade, your three minutes begins now. Well, thank you very much, uh, obviously, for having me here this morning. Thank you for the question. Larry, uh, you know I always love your passion. I, I'm not sure if I'm for a whole one-year moratorium, but uh, and I'm also not sure if I'm you know, um, aligned with being a real estate attorney who obviously benefits from growth and skyrocketing growth that is actually gentrifying and it's causing a lot of people not to be able to afford to live here. Um, we talked a little bit about the history and the culture that is Georgetown, and I really, really, really want to preserve that. Um, I think we need to do more than just have deed restricted areas, um, because even if an area is deed restricted, um, even though our tax rate may be uh, stagnant, uh, we can have our property values skyrocket and that causes people not to be able to afford to live here in Georgetown. And I've talked to multiple residents that have lived here for generations and they are not able to afford to live in Georgetown. A lot of minority and lower income families and I want to do everything we can to fix that. I know there's the electric energy debacle, which um, my friend uh, Larry Brundage uh, has, has brought up, um, but we need to do more to entice renters and working class Americans here to Georgetown. Um, that's really m one of m the main things that I want to do. Uh, there has actually been multiple developers, not just one, but multiple developers that have tried to encourage more renters and working class Americans here to Georgetown and they've been denied. And I wanna do everything I can to bring them here to Georgetown. Uh, last thing I will say is I think that we focus too much on sales tax so basically sales tax is, is encouraging a business to uh, come in here uh, to bring a bar or a restaurant. And we think that's the only type of revenue that is important to our city. And I actually, I, I don't agree with that. I think we need to encourage other types of res revenue. We need to diversify revenues um, that would include service workers and rental income and uh, things of, of that nature. And by leveraging all of those things, I think we can improve 
Georgetown as a whole. So again, thank you for the question. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Uh, if we have time, we may have some more questions to kind of address about the neighborhood preservation, especially TRG and, the, and some of the other uh, um, historic neighborhoods. And, and knowing that one, TRG is right in the neighborhood of where you meet uh, as a city council and mayor that, that we do preserve and remember uh, that, those residents. Now, 2020 has been a year like no other. I think we can all agree to that. And not only with the COVID pandemic, but there's been so much uh, community unrest. Um, so I just wanted to ask you the question, do you believe that systemic racism is an issue in Georgetown? If you don't believe that it's an issue, how will you work with the community that thinks that it is? Or if you think that it is an issue, what will you do to address this issue? And this can include addressing protesting, wearing face masks, you know, all, all of those types of issues. Now, now, along with that, we know that Police Chief Nero has community uh, initiative to address these issues and talk about the relationships and policing in Georgetown and how that will impact the community. And could, as part of your answer, could you give us your thoughts on how this initial or your thoughts on this initiative and uh, how it could be uh, initiated in Georgetown? So we'll start with you, Mr. Brundage. Your three minutes begins now. Thank you. I, uh, I have to be very honest. I'm very naive in relationship to uh, racism uh, past and present. Uh, I, uh, I'm not God. Uh, I can't uh, make a judgment of that nature. All I can do is talk with uh, people who uh, uh, have had experiences. And as we discuss, you and I, Regina, is listen. Uh, I think when you deal with people of different races, uh, occupations, religions, and you work side by side to a goal, uh, you lose those differentiations and you become a person on person. That's the approach I would like to take in my uh, moratorium. Have racism be an issue and, uh, and just discuss it. Uh, you know, we don't know what someone else's world is until we ask and until we L-I-S-T-E-N. Uh, I have, uh, with regard to Chief Nero's uh, community, uh, I, I was totally ignorant about it. I, in fact, I Googled it and I looked at it and I said, uh, I've attended every city council meeting, every workshop for two and a half years, and I've never seen this. Uh, you know, I, uh, I haven't been since they became virtual because uh, quite frankly, uh, I, I don't think the citizens' uh, uh, best interest are served by a virtual city council meeting, and I won't go into it, but uh, I have evidence, uh, but I did Google it. I read uh, his plan. I think it's very constructive. Uh, I don't know where he is in the implementation, uh, but you know we have a lot of words and we need more action. And I uh, encourage him to fulfill those words that he's uh, written on paper. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Day, your three minutes begins now. Uh, thank you very much. So the question is actually pretty simple. Do I believe that systemic racism is an issue? Of course it is. Uh, there's no way that you can have slavery and segregation and a lot of other evils persist for decades and not have long lasting effects. So of course, uh, there would be systematic racism in America and specifically in Georgetown. Um, that was a town that had the same repercussions of uh, that period of time in history. Uh, as an African-American myself and being in an interracial marriage, um, I feel the effects of systematic racism and systemic racism. And it, it's, it's actually just really unfortunate. And just to be very completely honest, it's very annoying. I've had someone that reached out to me this morning, uh, actually two or three people, and then they kind of commented on all of my social media sites 
uh, that racism does not exist. And that's just a lie. Racism exists, sexism exists, various different forms of discrimination exist. Um, as far as solutions to it, I, I, I know that that's the big question, right? Like, what can we do to solve this? Um, protesting is obviously one way to solve uh, different types of discrimination, sexism, racism, uh, whatever it may be. I do advocate very strongly for non-violent um, protesting. So as long as it's not violent, that is very important. Um, as far as face masks, I know that is kind of politicized and also grouped into this question. Um, I believe in individuality. I'm almost a closet libertarian. Uh, so I think that the people need to make the decision that is best uh, for their individual health and their individual family. And then lastly, uh, when we come to our Georgetown Police Department and Chief Nero, um, I want to, again, just kind of affirm Chief Nero has done an amazing job with the Georgetown Police Department. Um, I do not believe that his police department, the Georgetown Police Department, operates as negatively as other police departments do. Uh, he's done an amazing job with a lot of initiatives. I actually have the pleasure of serving um, as a uh, police chaplain for the Georgetown Police Department. But I do agree with what my opponent Larry Brundage said, which is we need to listen. I think right now, more than ever, people need to listen to people of color, our minorities, and say, how can we affect and how can we improve upon the racism that exists really in every community throughout the world. And I look forward to doing more things as mayor, not being silent in such a tumultuous time as this, but actually being very active and seeing what I can do to improve. I see the red card. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dade. Mr. Schroeder. Uh, just to answer the question real quickly, uh, absolutely systemic racism exists and it is a horrible problem. Uh, and I think we have the best police chief in the United States. Uh, and, and now I'm going to ask you to indulge me a little bit and, and let me tell you all my story, uh, because I believe that that's, you know, personal relationships is where it all begins. Uh, I don't like talking about this because frankly, it sounds like I'm pandering and, uh, and I don't like, you know, kind of name dropping race credentials. But uh, I grew up in Taylor uh, and Taylor was a majority minority city when I was growing up there. My dad was a football coach there for uh, 20 plus years. Uh, and so uh, I grew up in about as diverse a household and community as you can imagine. Uh, my parents uh, went through the University of Texas in the late 60s and uh, were tangentially involved in the civil rights movement. And so we were just taught from a very early age uh, about what had happened in this country and what still needed to happen. Uh, one of the most pivotal moments of my life that I'll never forget was uh, the Eyes on the Prize documentary on PBS. Uh, and I remember to this day, my dad sitting me down, uh, making me watch that. He was currently teaching, he was supposed to be teaching a World War II history class, uh, but he stopped the class and made them watch the Eyes on the Prize documentary uh, from his VCR tape every day after he would tape it. Uh, and that moment uh, is the moment that I decided uh, what I wanted to do with my education. Uh, so when I went to the University of Texas, I was a history uh, major and African American studies minor. Uh, I thought that I was going to teach African American studies uh, uh, on the college level was my dream. Uh, I've read every word that Henry Louis Gates, Cornell West, John Hope Franklin, Stanley Crouch, and uh, Albert Murray have ever written, uh, and those guys are some of my heroes. Uh, I, uh, when I left college, um, I had a professor that, that pulled me aside. Uh, she had been integral in starting the African American Studies Department at Harvard, uh, and she told me, don't do this. <laughs> Academia is horrible. Uh, it's the most political environment you'll ever enter in your life, uh, and it's miserable. Go to law school. And I said, yes, ma'am. Uh, and so I did that. But, but I would tell you that, that uh, diversity, uh, racial equality is, is something central and core to my life. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was uh, 16. Dad left, and uh, he is married to a Mexican-American woman. I've got, uh, so I've got a Mexican-American stepmom, uh, two uh, Mexican-American stepbrothers, and a Mexican-American stepsister. Uh, they live in Del Rio. My dad is still coaching, uh, and I will tell you, too, that's one thing, that, that sports is the great uh, equalizer. Uh, I grew up playing every sport that my dad coached, and one thing he taught me from day one was – it doesn't matter, you know, what color you are. We're putting the best guys on the field and go try to win together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, 
I'm going to throw a little curveball in here and try to mix it up a little bit and ask you one question that's, that's from Slido. So I think it's important. The city council seems to be fractured, which gets in the way of good governance. How do you plan to address that? Um, we'll start with Mr. Dave. Did I mute myself? Sorry about that. Um, let's see here. All right, let's try again. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Um, first of all, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Josh about uh, sports being a great equalizer. When we're all playing on the field, obviously that's, that's a great thing. And unfortunately, yes, our city is fractured. And the reason why is because if you look at the socioeconomics and the demographics of our city, uh, they are not reflected on the city council, unfortunately. I congratulate those who have made it onto the city council and who are able to do things for our great city, but without reflecting the accurate socioeconomics and demographics of our city, uh, they would be fractured. And you would have individuals who do not reflect the views and thoughts and opinions of our whole great community. Um, so yes, I, I, I do think that they are, are fractured. Um, how would I go about addressing that or fixing that? It's actually very simple. It's the boards and commissions. I think for far too long, people have applied to the boards and commissions, like uh, even Larry Brundage, I know you've mentioned that you've applied to a board of commission. Um, you sound very well versed and actually very qualified uh, for the application that you submitted. Um, but you are not allowed to serve on a board and commission. And I think that that's something we need to do better at. We need to do better at making sure that uh, those we recommend uh, to boards and commissions represent a diverse crock section of our broad community, uh, which would include various different types of people um, for various reasons. And I think that that's something we can improve upon um, I think that's something that actually the mayor's job is probably one of the most important. Um, so I'm actually going to save my last minute. So uh, Chuck doesn't even need to give me the red card. <laughs> but that, that, I think that that's the, the most important thing is just recommending a, a diverse cross section of qualified applicants from our boards and commissions to be able to represent our beautiful community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schroeder. I think we've got to create a, an environment on city council where we can have vigorous civil debate. Uh, I think council has gotten into the habit uh, of giving speeches from the dais. Uh, and I think that when we start to create an environment where, where folks can argue about issues on the dais, uh, you can take it from being personal attacks to, to you know, a debate about what this community needs. Uh, and that's one thing that I think the mayor can actually have a very direct impact on uh, by, you know, maintaining civility on the dais, not allowing council members to get out of line. The mayor has the absolute right to shut off a council person from speaking if they are speaking out of order. Uh, but at the same time, that mayor can say, hey, I, I want to hear what this person has to say about this issue. This council person said something completely different. The two of you guys have it out. Let, let's figure this out. And so I think when, when you can elevate the dialogue to being about the issues, folks can get finished arguing about those issues uh, and walk off the dice and shake hands and, and go have a beer maybe. Uh, you know, I'm an attorney, I, I argue for a living uh, way more than I'd like to, to be real honest, uh, but it's one of those things that you have to learn to be able to do, how to be able to argue the points and not the person. Uh, and I think that we can do that. And it's something, you know, honestly, we need to learn how to do as a society. I mean, you, you go on social media and all these platforms and you see people just screaming at each other uh, and nobody's, nobody's impacting anybody. Nobody's changing anyone's minds. And so what I think we've got to do is just elevate the discussion and have good, solid, vigorous debate. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brundage. Thank you. Uh, the city council is very fracturous, and uh, I think, frankly, the problem is, is the people have forgotten who the boss is. Uh, the boss is the citizens, uh, pure and simple. We, uh, we get confused with all the laws and uh, this and that, and uh, we become 
gods. Uh, I think some of the city council people think that they're better than they actually are. And, uh, and that's because they haven't stepped back and said, we owe our citizens everything, the truth, our uh, allegiance. And once we get the spirit that the, the boss is a citizen and we're to serve them, then all these things will disappear. If we can't, then I would say we need to look at term li uh, limitations, two terms max, and uh, you know, people can't adjust to the citizens being the boss, then they should withdraw. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, gentlemen, we're, we're, we're approaching the closing. I had one more question, but I'd rather us go ahead and move to our closing remarks. And if we have time for uh, uh, the last question, we'll get to it. But I definitely want to get to your closing remarks and wrap up and find out from you to dig deep over these next three minutes and tell us what makes you the right candidate you know, to vote for as mayor. What's your vision for the future of Georgetown and how will you ensure that you are considering the needs of all of its citizens in every sector of the community? How are you gonna work with, we just talked about um, the council, how are you gonna work to garner support of whatever position that you have? So we'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that as we close. Uh, starting with Mr. Schroeder. Thank you. Um, here's the promises I'll make to you. Uh, first and foremost, I will be accessible uh, and I will listen. Uh, my cell phone is on my website. Uh, people call it every single day. Uh, my email's on my website. Uh, I email back and forth to folks every single day. Uh, and what I can tell you is, you know, you're going to be able to get a hold of me. My office is on the square. People will walk into it every single day. Uh, if you need to tell me something, I'm going to listen. Uh, I'm willing to sit down and have coffee with, with anyone, anytime, anywhere, uh, and I'm going to listen to you. The second thing I'm going to promise is that I'm going to tell you the truth. Uh, some of you uh, on this, this uh, forum today, I'm sure I've made you mad with something I said, uh, and, and that may cost me your vote. But what I can tell you is I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you how I feel about an issue for too long, uh, communities of color have been lied to by politicians, been told what they wanted to hear, uh, and then the politicians go off and do whatever they want to do. I'm going to tell you the truth, whether you like it or not, uh, and you know, you're going to know where I stand, and then you can vote accordingly. The last thing I'm going to do is, if I promise you that I can do something, I'm going to get it done. I'm not going to tell you I can do something that I don't think I can get done. I'm going to be realistic and honest with you and tell you, hey, even if I agree with you on this, it's not going to happen. We can't make that happen. And so, but if I tell you that I can get something done, I'm going to get it done. Uh, and, and that's my promise to you is that I will meet with you. I will tell you the truth. And when I give you my promise that I'm going to get something done, I'll get it done for you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Brundy. Thank you. I have called my campaign the Impossible Dream Campaign. I uh, started out with the pledge not to solicit nor accept political campaigns because I wanted my allegiance to the citizens of this town to be unquestioned. I am still keeping that promise. Uh, I will make the citizens my boss there will no, be no divided loyalties between you and I. Uh, I am what I am. I, uh, I say what I feel. Uh, if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. Uh, that has been my uh, success. I have never lied to my boss nor my wife, and I won't start now. Uh, I will be accessible. I will have a quarterly meeting and uh, uh, talk to the mayor meeting, and I'll tell you the state of the, uh, the city, what our problems are and what we're facing. Uh, I want involvement by the, the citizens. I want to move workshops to Monday night preceding city council meetings so people who have an interest in observing their government can participate. And <clears throat> lastly, but perhaps more importantly, 
I want person on person city council meetings. This virtual meeting situation is robbing our citizens of their opportunity to observe and impact their government and it's unacceptable. Uh, I will be honest, I will be intelligent, intelligent and I will be transparent. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Dade. Well, thank you very much. And I think we actually finished up 10 minutes ahead of time. So if you want to throw us another curveball, we might have time for that. <laughs> you know, Larry Brundage, I, I, I enjoyed seeing you actually on the square yesterday. Uh, I cycled by. Uh, you do make yourself available. You had that big banner, you know, that thing is seeing Larry Brundage. I, Ah, if I was out there, I'd be sweating. And uh, Mr. Schroeder, I mean, obviously, yes. And, you know, you're on the square. It's very expensive to be on the square. Um, a lot of small business owners actually cannot afford to be on the square right now. And I actually talked with a couple small business owners who uh, were forced to leave the square uh, recently due to coronavirus and some other situations. So uh, there's a lot of things we need to do for our small businesses, our minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, and family-owned businesses. Um, I, the last word I want to leave you with is we, we really do need to represent all citizens and obviously talk really is cheap. I mean, we can say we're doing everything we can to represent all the citizens and all the businesses here in Georgetown. I literally translated all of my campaign literature into Spanish uh, to make sure that I reach all the citizens here in Georgetown, uh, the Spanish speaking citizens. Um, even just yesterday, I made sure that I distributed some yard signs in Southeast Georgetown area. Uh, that's actually one area that I'm um, really relatively, um, you know, kind of getting to know and talking with individuals there. And um, there's also a mailer uh, that just went out today and it went out to all the neighborhoods that often get missed in an election. And I'm very proud to say that it's not just my words, but it's my actions to say, look, everyone here in Georgetown deserves to live work, play, go to church, go to school here in this amazing community. Um, I can't promise to do anything more amazing than Larry or Josh, but I can promise to give my best effort. And I can promise to have a cool background here on my uh, screen. And I can promise to do the best I can uh, to make sure Georgetown has a mayor that is accountable uh, to its citizens. I can also make sure that I stop within 15 seconds that way yeah chuck doesn't have to give me the red screen again but this is going to be a very important election really my closing thoughts is i want to encourage everyone to vote i think that that's the most important thing whether or not you vote for myself or whether or not you vote for larry uh, who's the second most qualified candidate um, i want to encourage you all to vote i want to encourage you to get out there and be a part of this process because it's very important Thank you again for allowing me to appear on this forum. And we do have seven minutes in case Miss Regina, oh, I got the red thing. Um, but I do want to encourage Miss Regina, if you got another question, maybe we could do it really quick, one minute each. Well, we're not going to, look, I'm, I'm a stickler for time and we're not going to go over. So I don't know that we're going to have another question. Uh, I do want to tell you that I am so uh, pleased and excited that uh, you gentlemen were able to engage and. Uh, I feel like uh, provided us open and honest conversation and dialogue. Now, um, attend uh, people that have attended this forum, and remember, we are going to be posting this session on the GCC MA and the SEGCC websites. And um, if we, if anybody has additional questions, I think I heard from all of our candidates, please correct me if I'm wrong, that you are open at all times. And if we have additional questions, anybody can reach out to you at any time to ask those questions, correct? Okay, I wanna hear Roger, oh yes. Roger. All right, thank you, sirs. So I'm holding you to it because I have it recorded. No. And, and, and part of it, I heard, you know, no matter, no matter who wins or loses, I, I hope that we all stay engaged in this process and that we continue to help the citizens of uh, TRG and um, all of the issues that are going on uh, in our community, the living wage and just all of the uh, affordable housing and all of those things. So again, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Brundage. 
Thank you, Mr. Dade. Thank you, Mr. Schroeder, for taking the time out to answer these questions. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, early voting begins uh, October 13th, 2020. And we and please encourage your friends, family, loved ones, and enemies to vote. To vote early, if possible, but definitely on the third, be willing to get in those lines and, and vote. Uh, for more information about voting, uh, in addition to our websites, uh, you can go to the Williamson County uh, website, www.wilco.org forward slash Wilco votes. And then you can remember, you can also go to GCCMA website at www.gccmatx.org and go to the community tab or go to the segcc.org mm -hmm. website for additional election information. Uh, remember that next week we will be holding candidate forums for GISD place four and five, uh, place four at 9.30 and place five at uh, 11 o'clock. So please don't forget to register. Again, thank you for participating. And just before we leave, I would like to debut, we'll try it again at this session, our um, uh, informational uh, video. So I'm gonna let Chuck take it away. Okay, and so uh, bear with me for a second. Georgetown community. The Georgetown Cultural Citizens Memorial uh -oh. Association in association with the Southeast Georgetown Community Council brings you greetings and voter information today. November 2020 is a historic time. As we deal with a global pandemic, we are electing our next president, a new mayor, city council members, school board trustees, and countless other races. In Georgetown and throughout the country, they are expecting record turnouts. So we want to take some time out to encourage you to vote. Here are three simple tips that we believe that can help you. First, know when you can vote. Early voting begins Tuesday, October 13th through Friday, October 30th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Monday through Saturday. And on Sundays, October 18th through the 25th from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. Second, know where you can vote. For specific voting locations, visit www.wilco.org slash departments slash elections slash voting. We encourage you to vote early to avoid election day crowds. And third, there are no straight ticket voting this year, so completing your ballot may take a little time. You can print out a sample ballot by going to the Williamson County website, click on voter lookup, and sample ballot. You can mark your selections and bring them to the poll. So now you're ready to plan your vote. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to share this information and encourage your family, friends, coworkers, and neighbors to vote. So don't forget to vote. Thank you, gentlemen, and everyone, participants, have a wonderful day. Okay.